Hey, welcome everybody. So we're going to get going. We have um, Peter Swire Skyping in, but all I want to do is introduce you to your moderator. Uh, probably everybody knows Nancy Libin, who's former um, Chief Privacy Officer for the Department of Justice. She's now with the law firm of Jenner and Block. And um, Nancy, uh, you want to take it away? Sure, thank you. Um, Thank you, Tim, and, and thank you, IEF, uh, for this tremendous effort pulling this off on such a such a uh, snowy uh, after such a snowy weekend. Um, thanks, everybody, for for joining today. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists and give a little table setting and explain what we're here to talk about today. Um, to, at the end of the table, we have uh, Jim Helpert from DLA Piper. Uh, next to Jim is David Robinson from Upturn, and here next to me is Daniel Castro from ITIF, and we have Peter Swire, uh, who is Skyping in um, from, and he, Peter is a professor from Georgia Tech, former uh, privacy czar uh, in the Clinton White House, and uh, has, of course, a long history of, of uh, working on these issues, and it's great to have him to be able to participate remotely today. Um, so before I turn it over to Peter to give a little bit of a background presentation on his recent research, um, I want to just set the table a bit and explain uh, why we're talking about this issue, uh, the visibility that ISPs and other ent online entities have into the internet activities of consumers online. Um, as you all undoubtedly know the FCC adopted an order almost a year ago now establishing new open internet rules uh, relying on Title II uh, to reclassify broadband internet access services as telecommunication services. Uh, this order expressly applied certain provisions that the FCC has used to regulate the use and disclosure of certain customer information uh, the order expressly uh, applies those provisions to internet service providers. Um, specifically, a uh, particular provision, Section 222 of the Communications Act, um, which regulates a particular kind of customer information. The FCC uh, plans to conduct a rulemaking soon to determine how this statutory provision would apply to ISPs. The, rule, the rules in place now are very telephone-centric. Um, the statute is very telephone-centric. Um, and so we are here today to talk about the online ecosystem, the uh, business models, the kinds of consumer expectations that we find online, um, because we think that that will help inform uh, policy going forward and, and how new rules uh, ought to apply to internet service providers in this space. So with that said, um, I want to turn this over to Peter to give uh, background on the research he's done on data collection, use, and disclosure uh, online, and in particular ISPs. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Nancy, and thanks to Tim and all the State of the Net people for, for making this work despite the weather. Um, let me just ask on a technical side. Um, first of all, is the volume okay for people? Can they hear me? Nod your heads. Yeah, okay. And the second thing is, are you seeing both me and some slides at the, at the moment? Okay. That's great. Just, it's hard for me to tell otherwise. So um, just as, as preview, um, I'm sorry I couldn't make it to Washington today. We all understand the snow. And I'm heading out to Brussels um, right as this panel is finishing. I'm going to the airport. So I have to get off around 3.20 p.m. today. And... Um, Along those lines, I'll be uh, in Brussels by tomorrow, and we'll be debating Max Schrems on US-EU privacy tomorrow. Um, and there, there will be a, a live audio feed, and if we're lucky, a live video feed uh, up on YouTube, uh, which I've just uh, shown the, the highlight for. So that may be of interest to people, though that's not the focus of the report today, just something else going on this week. OK, so the introduction here. As Nancy has said, and as you all know, there's been this very hot topic about the role of ISPs uh, in the internet, and including broadband privacy. And last April, I was invited by the FCC to come talk to them in their, in their hearing, and there was a big factual disagreement. Some people who were speaking said that ISPs see everything. Some people said that ISPs don't see that very much. And this struck me as a 
factual issue and not just a policy issue. That's what this research um, is supposed to be. I'd hope to have it done by today, but with Safe Harbor and all, it's been it slipped just a little bit. So in the research, it's a description of the facts. I am not making any policy statements or recommendations or legal conclusions. Um, and I think accurate description is key to good policy, and I think pretty much everyone does. And I'm hoping that my experience in the field can be taken as a constructive thing where people from different points of view can converge on what the facts are like. As I said, this responds to questions <coughs> raised by the FCC in April. We have a detailed report expected within a month and is co-authored with my colleagues Justin Hemmings and Alana Kirkland. And I've said this today and, and uh, sent it around to the panel in advance, but if anyone sees mistakes in the facts that are being presented here, either now in this phase or after publication, I'm really in underlining to please let us know and we're going to engage with it and correct any mistakes that we find. <coughs> with that said, I disagree, and this is sort of the, I think the newsworthy bar, part, at least what Politico thought was newsworthy. I disagree with two factual statements in the letter last week from the 59 privacy groups. I did not see the letter until after it was published, so I didn't have an opportunity to say to folks before it went out, hey, I have a different view on the facts. And I've worked with a lot of those groups over the years. I'm, in fact, a policy fellow with one of them. And I hope I, hope I don't get cast out of the group of people who care about privacy by trying to report accurately on the facts here, but we'll see what happens. It's a tough, it's a tough town. Um, so the first of two things where there's contrasting views between that letter last week and my own view of the facts. The first one is something that we've seen in a lot of settings, which is along the lines that ISPs, internet service providers, have comprehensive visibility into user internet activity. Um, and my own view is that's not true in this day and age and will be less true going forward. Notably, encryption, such as the widely used SSL and the widely used HTTPS, encryption blocks content. So to the extent people have worried in the past about deep packet inspection, about ISPs looking into the content, if it's encrypted with HTTPS, then the ISP lacks the ability to do that unless it somehow breaks the encryption and we don't have reason to think that they do. Similarly, the standard encryption being widely used today blocks detailed links. So if you go to a search engine or some other website, a news site, you'll find out it was at the search engine or it was at CNN.com, but you don't find out the detailed links. And encryption has been spreading widely. So that's the first key factual point. The second key factual point has to do with another quote in the letter last week. And the letter said there's no way for consumers to avoid data collection by entities that provide internet access service. And again, my views are just factual here, which is virtual private networks. If I'd been there in person, I would have asked how many people have ever used one, and most of you would have said yes. But VPNs block the ISP access to content and detailed links. And VPNs go beyond the other encryption by also blocking even the top level URL. So when I sign on to Georgia Tech, they only find out I signed on to my Georgia Tech VPN. The ISP doesn't see anything more. And VPN use has climbed and I think will continue to climb. So what's, what's going on here is a factual contrast between the 1990s view some of us grew up in and today. The 1990s view of an ISP, there was a desktop or a laptop at home. They connected, people connected through unencrypted communications. And the ISP did the DNS lookup for all the surfing. And that has changed a lot. So today people have multiple devices, often logged in at Wi-Fi and other hotspots. There's heavy encryption and there's heavy use of VPN. So let me go to, and I should have done this larger, sorry. Here's the first of our pretty new slides that Marie Lepichon gets credit for, one of my grad students here. And this is showing the effects of HTTPS, the HTTP secure protocol. So if we look at the top step one in the diagram, I hope it's big enough to see, there's what's called DNS or domain name system lookup. And over on the left of it in blue, the user says, I want to visit Comfy Shoes. It goes over to the ISP, says, where's this Comfy Shoes located? And the ISP looks up the internet protocol address, 208.67, sends it back to the user, and now the user can go to comfyshoes.com, which is our example in this. Step two, once we have an IP address to go to, under HTTP, the, the traditional protocol, is can you send me to 208.67? It goes through the ISP in unencrypted form. It comes back through the ISP in unencrypted form, and all of the details about Comfy Shoes or CNN get seen there. And that's shown graphically by the three circles next to over HTTP. The first circle shows the high-level www link. The green circle shows the deep, detailed links, which are often very detailed in modern surfing. 
And the third part, oh, actually, I got it backwards. The second part is content, and the third part is the deep link. So an, H, an ISP under an HTTP approach has a technical capability when it tries to do it to see these things. But over HTTPS at the bottom, things change. So under HTTPS, the user does a handshake with ComfyShoes.com. It goes through the ISP in encrypted form with those blue arrows. And then the ISP delivers it back in encrypted form. And the user gets to see all the comfy shoes stuff, but the ISP is seeing encrypted content and encrypted um, uh, deep links. So that's a change. And the VPN, at least the VPNs that use encryption, which is many of them but not all of them, the VPNs goes deeper than that. So on this slide, virtual private networks, the user on the left has a blue user. I want to establish a VPN, like when I go to Georgia Tech. It goes through the ISP and establishes a handshake with the VPN on the right of the screen the yellow. And now we have an encrypted tunnel between the user and the proxy server. Step two is it goes to the proxy server under traditional lookup. A proxy server would be due to the domain name lookup, but when it goes back to the user, the ISP is still just seeing the tunnel. And a third diagram shows how HTTPS affects us even more. The user starts, it goes through the ISP by a tunnel. If it's HTTPS, once it's looked up, even the VPN does not see the deep links or the, comf or, or the, or the content. Uh, even the VPN only sees the top-level domain. So there's a blockade within a blockade in terms of visibility. This slide I'll do relatively briefly. It'll be a, a longer discussion in the tunnel in the, in the um, final report. But if you start at the bottom of this slide, the, the slide here is ISPs less than, I think, conventional wisdom thinks, or less than I thought before I dug into the facts here. So if we go down to the bottom in the purple, um, we see that ISPs um, are facing a world where it's not one person logging on from home or logging on from home and work. Instead, 60% uh, of Americans today spend time on mobile apps. Mobile is the coming domination. There's almost a half million Wi-Fi hotspots. And so the full picture of an ISP turns into a fractured picture to the extent individuals are doing part of their surfing through any one ISP. The second part in terms of ISP visibility by delivering ISP is that people have different devices. The number of network devices is climbing rapidly. People have tablets. People have smartphones. And so um, the ISP is connecting a device, but it doesn't necessarily, though it may sometimes have an ability to link across devices. The third one up from the bottom, the, the green one, is what we just talked about, is the effective encryption and virtual private networks and other encrypted proxy servers. And the top one comes back to this word comprehensive, which is, is there unique or comprehensive visibility to ISPs, which is, again, the factual claim that has been made in a lot of the debate so far. And I think when you look at the debate and look at it compared to a variety of other actors in the internet online ecosystem, online behavioral advertising and operating systems and social networks and search and e-commerce uh, and browsers and all the rest, the uniqueness or comprehensiveness claim doesn't stand up very well compared to how things work in today's internet. So conclusion slide, and then we'll go to comments and questions. We'll go to David in the comments and questions. The important policy issues, such as how to regulate a big industry and regulate internet access, should be founded on careful and factual understanding of today's technologies and tomorrow's technologies, and not based on assumptions about the way ISPs used to work. Encryption applies broadly today to key internet activities. I've listed some of them here. When you go to your bank or your healthcare provider or almost any e-commerce site that you pay with, that's encrypted. Search is overwhelmingly encrypted today. Social networks are massively encrypted today. Text messaging, WhatsApp, and other internet-based messaging is encrypted today. Netflix has announced they're going to go encrypted this year. And webmail is overwhelmingly encrypted today. And Chris Sagoyan and others have and I've worked on this for a long time in encryption, have documented how incomplete that was as recently as 2012. But post-Snowden, there's a huge adoption of encryption in a variety of ways. And encryption means you get the top-level domain, but not the deep links and not the content. And then beyond that, VPNs and other encrypted proxy servers are large and are likely to grow. And so any claims the ISP has unique or comprehensive access has to be tested against these facts, and I think the policy debate should be shaped by what's happening here. So briefly, some credits. Marie Le Pichon did the fantastic slides, and you're welcome to use them with a Creative Commons license. And I have research support from Georgia Tech Business and Georgia Tech 
Institute for Information Security and Privacy and from Broadband for America. The words that are said here are my words. People have gotten to see and give comments, but they haven't gotten to edit them. So there you go. Thanks very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, that was terrific. And I want to uh, ask David if he'd like to respond to some of the comments. Sure. Uh, thank you. And thanks, Peter, for a very thoughtful conversation. I'll say that Upturn has been uh, following this extremely closely. We were not involved in the preparation of the letter that was mentioned, but we did assist the uh, Open Technology Institute at New America with the preparation of its own report, which was also released last week and speaks to substantially uh, these questions. Um, like Peter, I speak only for myself. Like him, I'm focused here on describing facts, not policy recommendations, and corrections are certainly welcome. Um, I think Peter's presentation tells us a lot about the kinds of cloak and dagger maneuvers that are available to someone who zealously wishes to protect their privacy from their ISP. But in my opinion, the practical question that matters most here is how an ISP is situated relative to a typical user. And so I'd like to start with the straw poll that Peter um, suggested with perhaps a slight addition. Um, how many of you in the room would say that privacy is important to you? And then do me a favor and hold your hand up if you have, keep hands up if you used a VPN, let's say, within the last week. And keep them up if the VPN that you used within the last week was not one provided by your employer. Anyone? Okay, there are three hands up in the room out of uh, about 25 or four, four out of uh, 25 people. And here's what I'll, I'll say is that if you wanted to build a room where the consumer adoption of VPNs was as high as it is anywhere, um, this room would be a good place to start. It's by no means representative of most internet consumers. So I could say that, you know, VPNs may not hide your DNS queries, but the thing that we have to keep in mind is that when we get to that level of technical description, we're way beyond what most users of broadband service are going to experience. And so I just briefly want to go through a half dozen of the ways that ISPs can, in fact, still see what's going on in uh, a user's uh, internet connection and how I would argue that broadband providers are certainly unique. Um, I don't know about uh, what we would exactly mean by comprehensive, but certainly it is a unique perspective and a very revealing one that they have on internet use. Firstly, what's going on inside your house? When you're home and you're using Internet of Things devices like an internet connected lock, thermostat, or security camera, um, what can people, uh, what can the ISP know about your behavior? Like when you're home, when the lights are being turned on or off, uh, what even sometimes security cameras transmit in the clear, and I'll point to recent work by Nick Feimster and others at Princeton on this um, that substantiates these concerns in what I found to be an unnerving level of, of detail. A second example, so keep in mind, if you're not using a consumer VPN for your personal browsing, then even if the traffic is encrypted, as a growing fraction of the web is, the ISP is still going to see those requests for which domain name you want to access, which is to say those DNS queries, which are still transmitted in the clear, meaning not encrypted. Even if you might have heard about DNSSEC, that's about verifying the accuracy cryptographically of results that you receive. Even when that's in use, your um, queries are encrypted in the, I'm sorry, your Queries are in the clear when they go out, which means that AT&T Uverse, for example, which um, claims the power to, quote, use your individual web browsing information to um, target offers and otherwise commercially use that information, they're going to know, are you a ChristianMingle.com type or more of an OkCupid.com person? Or maybe you're not dating, maybe you're at more of a BabiesRUs.com phase of, phase of life. Um, they're going to know that. And as is the case with metadata in other contexts, it can be, and in the aggregate typically is, extremely revealing. Thirdly, some stuff, as we've all pointed out, is unencrypted. For example, if you go to WebMD, whatever ailment you look up, the, uh, the path is going to be public. Only 40% or slightly less than 40% of federal.gov websites uh, are encrypted. If you're submitting a whistleblower complaint to the Ag Department, you're still doing that over a link that's in the clear. Um, fourthly, location, especially with respect to mobile broadband ISPs. You know, which grocery store are you loyal to? Do you spend much time, have you spent much time at the hospital lately? Do you have kids in private school? All these things are inevitably, no matter how privacy motivated you may be, available to 
your service provider, and you might not know it, but already today, Verizon claims the right to use your device's location history and your browsing history, to ma and, and they go out to other brokers and match this with gender, age range, interests, and shopping preferences. Fifthly, private browsing that it turns out isn't really private, even when you clear your cookies and open up a special private browser for whatever it is that might be the most sensitive or intimate uses that you make of the internet, um, there's a growing use of active interventions on the part of the ISPs to tag your traffic in ways that they and others can see. So we've seen, you, you might have heard about permacookie injection. So Verizon front runs uh, traffic now with signals that they add to it that tell the world, this so-called UIDH uh, header, who, uh, who you are. Six months after rolling out the program in response to public pressure, they introduced an opt-out option, but I want to be clear that that was, according to them, strictly at their discretion and not something that the law required them to, to, to offer. And lastly, as a final example of something that is definitely visible to ISPs, think about video service. So as, as uh, as uh, Peter mentioned, 30, uh, uh, it's likely that by the end of 2016, although it's not true today, a majority of the packets exchanged on the North American internet may be TLS encrypted. The reason that's true is because Netflix, which represents 34% of total downstream bandwidth, has, a, has announced it's going to encrypt by the end of 2016. But um, even when they do encrypt, the ISP is typically going to see your traffic and know that it's Netflix. And in fact, even if you use a VPN, if you've got gigabytes of data that are flowing to you at a steady rate on a Saturday, it's not hard to infer that that is an over-the-top video binge-watching session. And we, we know we've all been there. And so a policy question for another day, should an ISP, or perhaps for later in this discussion, should an ISP be permitted to use such information for purposes other than managing its network or providing your service? Purposes, for example, such as an individualized pricing offer to people that, that, uh, that the ISP has identified as heavy users of a competing over-the-top um, video uh, service and I'll one the final thing I'll say and then close and let us all discuss is that one reason that the uh, role of ISPs is particularly concerning is the relative lack when compared with application providers of choice that people have especially on the wireline side in broadband provision where the FCC finds that for a majority of Americans if you want a modern robust broadband connection that is to say one that is 25 or more megabits uh, per second you're going to find that um, in about for about 53% of Americans, there's just one option. So what they decide to make the price of admission in terms of how much data uh, you surrender becomes uh, a very important, I think, and a very relevant salient question for regulators. And I'll stop there. Thank you, David. Uh, Jim, did you want to? You look um, like you sure. Just just speaking practically, I, I, this is a is a very well constructed debater's argument, um, positing that there is access to a lot of information, then positing that um, there is no choice using a particular aspirational definition that the FCC put forward when it, for universal service funding purposes, its definition of broadband is 10 megabits, not 25. And when it's found that I think 98% uh, of Americans have a choice of three gig uh, three uh, megabit per second wireless ISP. So in fact, the real choice here is more like four or five for most Americans. So there is choice actually. And uh, ISPs have a very strong incentive not to creep out their users because unlike all the other players in the internet ecosystem, they have a direct uh, revenue stream that they're obtaining from consumers, and they have an incentive to retain their trust. Uh, the argument about high-level DNS information coming to the ISP puts the ISP on exactly the same level as um, any other player in the whole internet advertising ecosystem. Um, and indeed, uh, the encryption would actually trend to give the ISP less information than an operating system provider, for example, who will see all the information unencrypted. Or if somebody goes through a social media platform or, or some other online platform to access content, that information is then read when the consumer moves on. And meanwhile, there are 
uh, entities in the advertising ecosystem who have far, far more information. And really, I think from a public policy perspective, we need to think about whether we move toward a world, and this is what the OTI report is aimed at, where the, a tiny fraction of the internet ecosystem is subject to a far, far greater uh, degree of regulation than anybody else. Those players need, to, people who provide broadband service are making very, very significant investments in, in infrastructure that under the net neutrality order, and I happen to agree with the net neutrality order, but the consequence of the net neutrality order is that anybody else can ride over that investment. To say that the whole rest of the advertising world that is, has, the ISPs play a very small role in, that has far more data than any, any ISP uh, should be able to, should not be, be re subject to the FTC regulatory framework, but now ISPs, which have operated under that framework uh, for years and did not engage in outrages um, and did, were not more intrusive than the ad networks by any means, uh, should suddenly be subject to a very, very rigorous opt-in regime that would make investment for other competitors in the broadband world a much riskier position. If we care about competition, in broadband, which is part of the whole premise of FCC regulation, we don't want to create huge barriers to what will be substantial investments. And I, I think that the logic uh, of this, I, I think this comes out as pretty much a wash when I, I hear your, your points, David, in terms of the position of the ISP and the position of other players and to have a discriminatory, weird sort of special regulation of that category of people raises some troubling implications if we want to encourage broadband competition and investment in broadband networks. So what, what I heard there, uh, the end of what Jim was saying, there, just to break it into two buckets, there is a question of whether asymmetric regulation is justified, warranted, uh, based on the, the, the technology and the way that <clears throat> the ecosystem operates. And then also, what are the consequences of that um, so before we get to the latter, what the consequences of asymmetric regulation would be, because I think there's significant policy issues there, let's just focus just a bit more on, on whether the asymmetric regulation is justified. I, I, would, I don't want to leave that topic just yet, um, because I think, it, I think there's more to, to unpack here. So I'd, I'd invite, uh, I don't know, Daniel, if you want to comment on, on that issue, or if Peter then afterwards would like to comment. Uh, actually, let me invite Peter to first respond to what was said here, and then let me comment on that. OK. And I might, I might, uh, I want to put back up the um, slide about HTTPS for a second. Let me, uh, and, and is it visible to you all right now or not, this not slide? Yeah. It is? No. OK, I have to do, go back to shared screen. And the reason is I'm going to need to jump off in a minute, and, and I apologize for that because I want to make my flight. Um, but I want to just sort of make sure, we, and now is there a slide showing? Yes? Yeah. No? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And this is a question to David, and, and if you're not comfortable, David, then, then you know, we'll, we'll follow up later. But on this basic fact about HTTPS, which has become much more common in recent years, is it your understanding that the shift – that in an HTTP world, an ISP, if they decide to go after it, could see top link and detailed link and content. But today, deep link and content get blocked under HTTPS, and so the most they get is top level link. Is there any qualifications or limitations on that, or does that seem to be accurate from what you understand about HTTPS? Um, yeah, that uh, that essentially matches uh, my understanding, and I hope that nothing I said seemed uh, to certainly I didn't intend to imply otherwise. But I think the question that's also a piece of this is how much uh, information can be inferred out of those domain names. And and so I'm gonna I, and so I and thank you, Dave. I mean I I have read and admired David's work in a lot of respects, and so on this important point, just factually describing things, the shift to encryption has this effect on what ISPs even could do, assuming they can't break the encryption, which I don't think they're going to be trying to do. So I, I'm going to leave the policy debates to others. That's sort of the role I decided to play here. <laughs> but I think it's useful to see that there's agreement, I think, and there's going to keep being agreement, that in an HTTPS world, there's been a big change. So I'm going to sign off at that, I think. 
and um, and uh, wish you all good luck. And uh, we'll probably re revisit this a lot more. So thanks. Thank you, Peter. Great. Thanks. Um, and I think that's a, a really useful place to start because um, you know when I was hearing both sides of this conversation, you know, I, I read Peter's work. I read the New America Foundation report, and you know, they they both I think highlight you know, some common facts and, and they have different emphasis, um, but the New America ends, report ends up in a very different place. And, you know, I think it's important to realize what is very common in, in these two areas. I mean, certainly, um, you know, it's important to know that ISPs can analyze data uh, to determine things about the ind individual. That's why we have targeted advertising that ISPs are able to roll out. And that's a very good thing. You know, I don't think, you know, there, there's no kind of lack of understanding about the fact that, you know, the reason um, they have some of these opt-in or opt-out programs is so specifically they can do advertising uh, to benefit the consumer. Um, but I also agree that uh, with Peter that there's definitely this trend when we look at what's happening in the world of technology towards more encryption. And as we move in this direction, um, there will be you know changes that affect what ISPs will able will be able to see in this area. And if you look at what Google announced um, now about a year ago, they specifically said that search results would be uh, the part of their search algorithm ranking was going to be using whether or not a site has HTTPS on it. So they, they said that right now is going to be a very small signal, but later on they really wanted to encourage sites to move in this direction and that they'd make that a larger signal. So we can see this as a trend that will play out over time. Uh, certainly I'm not surprised that federal agencies are lagging. Uh, they've been lagging uh, in many areas. Um, and we also have to, I think, look at what the response is likely from consumers. Um, I, you know, I agree with you know your your poll here in the room that a lot of people aren't using VPNs right now. Um, I think for very good reasons. They don't have a real reason to. Um, if they felt compelled to, they likely would. And these are the changes that we generally see play out. You know, when people install ad blockers when they were tired of ads or, or angry about the ads they were seeing. Um, I think people uh, would move towards using VPNs if they felt that there was some value to them for paying for that service and, and going through the, the you know, maybe somewhat difficult process of installing it. Um, but I also think the fact that when we kind of poll everyone in the room about this, the fact that, you know, we don't have a lot of people saying they're using VPNs or, or concerned about this kind of brings us to the question of why this is a policy discussion, whether or not it's a legitimate one to be having right now. Um, because we're not having a panel discussion right now about whether or not advertising online is a good thing. We're not having a panel discussion about whether targeted advertising is a good thing. You know, this is specifically about whether the FCC should be regulating ISPs, and in this case, it's really should they be regulating them in a unique way that's different than the rest of the internet ecosystem. So a lot of the work that I've done in the past has been looking at how the FTC has regulated online advertisers and how the, um, you know, the, the voluntary practices, um, the codes of conduct, the notice and consent, how all of those frameworks have led to the consumer options that are available today and, and you know, whether or not they empower consumers or not. Um, and you know, I think it's important to look at it in this kind of uh, historical and evolving context of what the FTC is doing uh, when we start asking questions about what the FCC should be doing because we're not you know, the, the question here is really, is something bad happening to consumers that's unique that the FCC should be taking action against? That's, that's the policy question. And I think even for those who are very concerned about privacy, I have a hard time seeing in this space where there's that unique compelling reason to regulate differently, specifically because, you know, I, and I would put this to the panel, can you name a single ISP that doesn't allow consumers to opt out of these types of advertising practices. And if there's not, then what's the reason for FCC intervention here? Sure, so let me respond uh, to, a couple, to a couple of things. One is, I think, how competitive you think the broadband market is depends totally, as Jim points out, on what you think counts. So if you think that a three megabit wireless link is enough uh, and that it's in the same market as a 25 megabit coax link, um, then you think, well, there's lots of competition. If, on the other hand, uh, you happen to believe, as I happen to believe, that a 25 megabit link is best understood as a different kind of product in terms of what it allows consumers to do, or at least a different subtype of broadband, then um, there's 
not a lot of competition on the wireline side. So I think we see the same facts and, and have different perspectives on them. Could I ask a question about that, though? Sure. Would, would do you, are you proposing that this new set of rules apply to broadband providers who provide 25 megabit per second service? Or are you also going to apply it all the way through the ISP um, internet access market? I, I When I read the OTI report, it doesn't proposed limiting and creating a special category of regulation for markets where uh, uh, businesses are really investing a lot of money to provide particularly fast broadband and there isn't a choice beyond that entity. Well, let me ask you, how would you feel about such a proposal? I don't think it would make a lot of sense, but I'm also not sure that special rules for internet access providers where consumers clearly have a broad choice make much sense either. Well, this may be beyond my, my pay grade as a suppo supposed to be providing here, you know, the, the, the facts, but I'll, I'll point out that as it's an unresolved, first of all, I mean, you know, as it's an unresolved debate, I think that the question of whether the regulation is to be, is best described, quote, as asymmetric, um, that's question begging. If we call it asymmetric regulation, we're adopting the view that there's not a relevant difference between the regulated parties and other parties, and I think that's exactly what this discussion um, uh, is about. And I just wanted to finally, when we're talking about what are people buying, as D Daniel brought up about VPNs and other sorts of products that might preserve privacy, I think it's worth noticing that when, for example, Uverse provides its uh, its opt-out and it's, uh, uh, you know, a $30 a month uh, sort of a thing, that compares radically with the amount of money that actually can be gotten from users' data. So, you know, Wall Street watches very closely average advertising revenue per user. Google, which is far and away the winner of that game, gets $45 per user per year, not per month. And Facebook gets about $10 per user per year. So when AT&T says, you know, our ability to comprehensively record and to sell what you're doing um, is worth $30 a month, what they're doing is overpricing that to create a new normal. And I'll say finally that as to your question of whether there are meaningful opt-outs for each such tracking program, I think history teaches us that we're not sure because in fact we don't have comprehensive visibility into such tracking. And so when, for example, the Verizon tracking began, there was a six-month period where no opt-out was afforded. Could someone else be doing that now? And, and uh, those of us who are concerned about this not be aware of it? I think the reasonable answer is, is, is that that's a reasonable possibility. Well, I want to respond to two things. I mean, one, I mean, I, I have looked at you know, the ISP's privacy policies, and, and anyone can. I mean, they're all, you know, all the major ones are online. And, you know, I think they're pretty explicit about what they're doing with data, what consumer options are available, and you know they know that the FTC could certainly take action against them if they're violating that. Um, and so I, you know, I, I hear you saying that you know we don't know what's going on, but we kind of do. I mean, they're saying it pretty clearly, and if they don't do what they say, you know, they'll be held accountable for that. So you know, I think we have to be a little careful with that. But you know, what I'm, I think a little more concerned about is when you you know, you, you talked about the, the discounts um, that you get uh, if you opt into these programs. I mean, I'm an AT&T U-verse consumer. I don't know if I need to disclose that uh, to, for some kind of bias there. Um, I did opt to take the $30 discount. Seemed like a really, you know, decent deal to me. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly recognize that, you know, some people would say, oh, you know, they're getting too high margins on this trade-off or something. Um, but the answer to that, though, would be, it sounds like you're kind of hinting that is price regulation of ISPs, um, because if you're saying that you can't, you won't allow ISPs to price their services the way they want. I mean, that's saying you know that's moving from a privacy discussion into a price regulation discussion. And I don't think that's something the FCC is interested in doing. I don't think that's good policy. But I'm wondering if that's really what you're talking about. I mean, the way that I would see it, and again, I should hasten to add, I speak only for myself here, is that what we're talking about is less how many dollars can be charged for the product and more a question of what the product is. But you, because it sounded like you were uncomfortable with, you know, a $30 discount. Um, and it seems to me this is the type of policy that we actually want the FCC, you know, when they, when they go through any kind of rulemaking, to make sure that this isn't hurt. You want consumers to be able to get more affordable internet access. You want them to be able to receive these types of discounts. Just like we have in the rest of the online advertising space, a lot of consumer benefit 
from all this innovation around how we can you know, create new business models and use data and use personalized advertising, I would think we would want the same thing with broadband providers and, and make sure ISPs can do that. And it's not just ISPs, I'll, I'll add, it's also, you know, the, the personalized advertising on, on cable TV boxes and everything like that, where we see this trend uh, going when we talk about technology trends. This is a big upcoming trend. We want to make sure all of that is still enabled in the future. Uh, but you can't do that if you tell ISPs, but you can't pass these benefits on to consumers in the form of lower prices or if you restrict these types of products and services. Um, and I'd add one other point with regard to the AT&T situation. AT&T very forthrightly put out very, very clear notice about this um, uh, offer to consumers. And that's why there's a lot of focus on this. There's a huge universe of people who, of entities that are trading consumer data or collecting health data, all these other, other things, and they're, they're not providing clear notice and presenting a value proposition to users. So it seems to me that that net, both in providing consumers with a choice, you may disagree with the value of that was presented, but that's the, the market ultimately. This is actually closer to consumers, much more transparent, and in the end, there's a much greater restraint on uh, a broadband ISP um, acting creepy with consumer data because they lose an awful lot of money. The value of, of a subscriber who's getting broadband service and some other service is, is huge. To, to focus on this small subset of the internet ecosystem and say, let's go to town and really, really establish huge regulatory uh, burdens on them and restrict their uses of information when the whole rest of the internet ecosystem is, sub is subject to the FTC framework and the FCC uh, could very easily adopt rules that replicate um, what the, the FTC rules that have long applied in this context. It seems to me that, that, that it's a little bit arbitrary um, uh, to focus on this, this particular part of the ecosystem and say we need to really regulate these guys and leave everybody else under the FTC regime. If the, the FTC regime is good enough for, for others, it ought to be good enough for ISPs. So uh, I want to um, give David a, a chance to respond to all of this, um, but I, I just want to shift the conversation slightly given our, our timing and I, along these same lines though, so I think it'll give, I think hopefully David a, a chance to respond, but um, I, uh, be interested to know, and then this picks up on what you were saying, uh, we were all saying earlier, um, what the harms are that we are trying to address. Because I, I just, I think it would be useful to talk about what harms are theoretical or, or you know, speculated to possibly occur in the future and and what are the real harms with, and Jim was getting somewhat at this too at the end, that we are concerned about. And I would just also be interested to hear from folks. We have the FTC, it's our principal privacy regulator in the United States. Um, the FTC has tended to, in its enforcement actions, go after companies that are uh, using data in a way that uh, harms consumers. Um, the EU, which we all know is very uh, active in this area, also has gone after the, the large platform providers and, and other entities and not um, ISPs. So I think it would be good to get on the table uh, some of those harms and uh, discuss some of the regulatory uh, responses. Well, let me, uh, having had an accumulated uh, list here of opportunities to, uh, or of things that might, that might warrant responses. Let me start not with the last ask, but instead with a piece of it that I, I just want to make sure doesn't get lost, which is, you know, how we should think about this, for example, AT&T U-verse thing, where indeed, as compared with other ISPs, they were relatively better about disclosing what they were doing. Um, and that is that I think that you have to look at Uverse as a product that does something that a lot of other products don't do, including a lot of other internet access products in terms of the level um, of service that it provides. And in my opinion, uh, it doesn't have uh, meaningful competition in many of the markets that it operates in. And in my opinion, the $30 a month number that they're charging for privacy is 
um, at least based on the publicly available evidence, including the evidence of great interest to investors in the company and its competitors, um, totally unrelated to any kind of revenue stream that it gets out of that data, which unless it's getting t an order of 10 times as much revenue out of personal data than Google can, which strikes me as not a reasonable supposition, uh, then it's pricing this in a way that's way more than the market value uh, of the data. And I think um, it's reasonable to ask um, why it feels comfortable doing that. And I think the answer is because, uh, contrary, notwithstanding the things that uh, Jim says that are quite true about uh, how much revenue it gets from each of its uh, users, the truth is that um, its privacy choices are unlikely to drive very many customers away from its service. Uh, I think if it priced uh, the, the privacy option as a uh, reasonable simulacrum of its actual value to the company, uh, then we'd be looking, I think, at a very uh, different set of, of numbers. But it's, it's, it, it's telling that um, AT&T, for whatever reason, finds it preferable to set a monthly price for, for, for privacy that's, that's really in a, a different ballpark. Jim, you look like you wanted to respond, but I didn't. It's, it's, uh, in the end, these are new services, new offerings, and I think there's probably some experimentation in what uh, the market would would accept. I don't think that it's the world of, of today's regulation of broadband internet access service to start questioning specifics of pricing when companies are, are trying to figure out what what uh, value consumers place on different types of services, including a privacy-sensitive service. There is no choice about this uh, with regard to most other services on the Internet, most of which are free. Um, so it's hard to measure what the, what the value would be. And uh, I think that may explain some of this as well. Just a small point on that. I mean, you know, if you go to most grocery stores in the United States, if you don't use the loyalty card, you can pay up to twice as much um, on certain products. Um, I certainly don't think the value of my data to the grocery store is, you know, the, the double my grocery bill. And I think there's plenty of competition in grocery stores. And I don't think we're talking about regulating them. So, I mean, I, I don't think that the ISPs are doing something, you know, ununique in this space compared to most other competitive industries. And so I don't think, you know, you can just say that this number indicates there's no competition in this space. There's, plenty of areas where this similar type of pricing occurs. So uh, just to go back to this uh, notion of consumer harm and, and whether the harms justify the asymmetric regulation, and I, I'll clarify if by asymmetric regulation, what I meant was the treatment of, in this case, ISPs differently than other similarly situated entities. And by that, I mean other players in the online ecosystem, whether it be social networks, uh, search providers, and so forth that have a great deal of visibility uh, into what consumers are doing in online. And, even, and indeed, as encryption becomes more standard, we'll continue to have that visibility while ISPs uh, visibility will trail off. And so just looking as a policy matter, looking forward, um, would like to try to, to develop a little bit more what it is that would justify different treatment, because that is uh, certainly by all accounts um, where things look like they're going. Well, can I just, I mean, I think when we look at the application layer and whether it is similarly situated to um, ISPs such that there'd be a lack of, sim I mean, if, I mean, here's where I come down is if symmetry is, you know, it refers to a situation in which ISPs are not treated like common carriers, then, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm against it. I, I think that the application layer switching costs, if you're not happy with the services that are provided by, uh, you know, the Gmail or the Hotmail or the Yahoo Mail that you may or may not be using, um, those switching costs are much, are, I think, are much lower and the options for the kind of uh, broadband that people, I think, already strongly prefer and will in the coming future of heightened bandwidth use increasingly strongly prefer, um, I think it's just there are not the same kinds of, of choices there. And so when there is uh, a lack of a 
uh, option that is that is privacy preserving on a par with the internet as we've known it up to up till now uh, that's meaningfully available to people um, you know to me that's a very different a very different picture than the one that happens at the application layer so I, I'm just trying to get it with the harm so the harm I'm, I'm, tr I'm looking for the privacy harm um, I guess, uh, and not so much, because uh, we're talking about lack of choice right. in the marketplace, but going back to what the privacy harms are, especially given what we have heard about increasing trends toward greater encryption and what that means for the visibility that entities online will have, ISPs versus other online entities, um, what are the privacy harms down the road that, that would justify uh, regulation of ISPs more strictly than other entities. So that's that's what I'm. Been, I'm I apologize if I wasn't clear in that, but that's what I'm trying to get at. If yeah, I mean, I think that you know, it's always funny what counts as a privacy harm, quote unquote, because my experience is that when the harm actually ramifies and when the troubling risk reaches bad fruition, we tend no longer to regard the issue as a privacy issue. So if, for example, in the context of a you know, job application, I'm worried that something about my status may be used you know, against me, uh, that's a privacy concern. If it is used against me, that's an employment issue. And the same may be true in you know, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, purchasing of consumer data increasingly by law enforcement authorities as well, and the use of that in emerging, you know, targeting scores. If I'm worried that uh, the police may have uh, a negative view of me or a high threat score for me, as one recently uh, released uh, product that uses commercially brokered data uh, comes in, uh, then. Uh, I have a privacy concern, but of course, if any of that reaches bad fruition, I have a criminal justice issue. So, I mean, I think the, the, the full range of ways in which powerful institutions use sensitive data about people, you know, is implicated by the data that, I mean, I, I leave it to members of the audience to decide whether or not you find that um, even after stuff is encrypted, there's a sensitive aggregate picture that the ISP has that I would say uniquely has, and I think you know, it's not in any one place, but it is in fact across the spectrum of ways that powerful institutions use data, that this data, you know, could be, uh, could be used in problematic ways. I, I'm not sure in light of Peter's presentation, particularly as to the different ways that consumers access the internet, that in the course of, of a day, I mean, we could do the same thing. Do you ever, do you use your smart, we could run through the whole thing, as Peter said, that the ISP actually does have more data in this day and age. And I don't think the quality of the data that it has in a world of HTTPS, which is coming, whatever, I actually used uh, VPN when I was living in France because I didn't want the French intelligence services to be listening in on all the communications I had, but that was a while ago. But, uh, but with HTTPS coming, I'm not sure that the ISP is going to have more information. And if you think about what an operating system provider sees, for example, if, if a Netflix communication is, once, once HTTPS goes on with Netflix, the operating system will see the, the content of the movies decrypted, will know when the user stopped, will be in a position really to gather a lot of information that the ISP will not see. And so I do, I do think that this is a much more complicated picture than the OTI report um, portrays when you look at the trend over time of more encryption. And yes, Netflix is just one Example, on the other hand, Netflix has been a big source of complaints by privacy groups that, you know, people would find out what sort of movies you like to watch. That's being foreclosed right now with, with uh, <clears throat> this move toward encryption. And the fact that a user goes to Netflix, for example, is something that many, many other players on the Internet will, will know. Maybe not knowing the name of the individual, but for advertising purposes, absolutely they will know that. And there really isn't incrementally much more that the ISP has other than the, the name and address of the user. And the ISP has more disincentives to do creepy stuff with the information because they don't want to lose the subscriber. And if you look at the, total, the, the whole period of time 
of FTC regulation of ISPs. You know, form was a blip on the screen, totally failed. I've advised a lot of ISPs on privacy compliance and anything to do with medical data, whether somebody's unemployed, those are things that are completely off the table uh, because they would be objectionable to users. Can I just say that I wish I could believe that wireline ISPs providing modern speeds were half as afraid of losing their customers over this kind of thing as Jim seems to be confident that they are. Well, I think if you if you were to compare actual practices, you would see that this does not happen. The the sorts of of harms like targeting people based on their visits to WebMD, um, and uh, that uh, use of location data under the FTC framework, which is all that needs to be ap applied by the FCC now that it's categorized broadband internet access service as um, a common carrier service is enough to require clear and conspicuous notice and opt-in consent for use of location data anyway. So I think we wind up in more or less the same place to foreclose the harms, but um, I, I, I do think that there's more discipline and more, also much more reputational risk to a large ISP associated with doing something that would be um, objectionable from the privacy front. You could point to one or two little circumstances, but it, it's definitely not the norm. I mean, there's also the, the regulatory risk, uh, which I think is uh, important as well. I mean, ISPs, I think, are motivated not to do certain things because they don't want regulators to step in with, you know, overbearing rules on them. So, you know, I think there's a lot of incentive there. But again, I think, just coming back to this question, what harms are there to consumers, I think it's important to, again, look at what's happening today. If you look at the options available to consumers at their ISPs, they can opt out of these practices and they have a number of tools to go further and protect their privacy if they want. Even if you don't think there's competition, you can do these things. So at the end of the day, the question is, what does the FCC need to do to help you know, consumers have the kind of experience they want? Of course, as we know, there's different types of consumers. There's ones that don't care about privacy. There's a bunch of us in the middle, and there's some that really care about it a lot. But even those that care about it a lot, if they can opt out of these practices, if they can have some competition in the marketplace, and if they can access tools to protect their privacy, then the question is, what additional regulation does the FCC really need to do? And so I'm, I'm hoping when they're looking at the CPNI rules, that they're keeping it very focused on what CPNI was originally about, this you know, kind of basic network information and how it's being used for these you know, limited services. Um, and with that, I'm afraid we're going to have to close. We're coming to the end. Uh, I, we don't have much time, but if anybody does have questions, I'd love to, to uh, allow that. Yes, please. Just a question for David. One of the um, uh, New American OTI, they published a number of reports around municipal broadband, uh, Google Fiber, what have you. If I accept your premise, um, because they want to see more work done on the side of uh, promoting municipal broadband, and I accept what you're saying, ISPs really have a lot to look, I'd be very concerned about an FCC regulating because of the principal agent problem um, between uh, having more and more municipal broadband providers being ISPs. So I would see a much higher risk of sort of the local municipal provider spying on the people in the community than the ISPs because they're closer. It's like talking about creepiness. You know, the, your neighbor who's working at that local facility will actually know the users in the community. So, um, you know, I, let me just finish the first sure. question real quick. Um, I spent the morning going through the transparency reports um, from various ISPs and the um, high rate of you know government requests. Max Rams talked about this with Stove. And to see more and more municipal broadband we're talking about these kind of things, I'm just concerned in a world where they're carving up the internet, this agency's handling this, our partner transportation wants to do that. All the internet privacy pieces are regulated by different entities. As a user, I don't really feel like this is a whole, wholesome way to think about it. So um, you know, that's just my observation. I would say if I accept your premise, I see this concern with principal agent problem with having more government broadband providers. Well, I think that, uh, so first of all, I'm, it's outside my area to look at the municipal, the regulation of municipal broadband. I mean, I'm not a regular telecom regulatory lawyer in the first instance, but what I will say is that I don't, I don't think that anything I've said is intended to augur against robust privacy protections on municipal broadband networks. Um, and if indeed there are, uh, 
you know, risks that are specific to, to, you know, to those networks. I think, you know, the right kind of regime across all broadband uh, might well address them, but I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave it at that. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, um, I want to encourage uh, folks to stay for the zero rating panel, which is coming up next uh, in this room, and there's a panel on the IANA transition across the hall next as well. Thank you all for being here. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks, likewise. Yeah.